All right. Happy Tuesday and welcome back from the holiday weekend. If you're stateside here for another episode, a surprise episode of Learning Tech Talks, where we are continuing to explore the landscape of learning technology while cutting through the fluff and getting questions answered for you. Uh, but this one's I don't know. This was a last minute audible. Last night, I was realizing Ashley was not going into labor like I thought this weekend. And I thought, you know what? I've got a really important topic that would be super fun and important and timely to talk about. And I thought, I know who I'm going to ask to join me because nobody wants to listen to me for an hour. And I texted Ben Eubanks and said, Ben, hey, do you want to jump online and talk with me on the great resignation tomorrow morning? And Ben was so kind to say, absolutely. So, here is the infamous, no, not infamous. I've used that wrong before. The famous <laughs> Ben Eubanks. It. Yeah, there you go. From <laughs> Lighthouse Research and Advisory. And you know what? We're going to be talking about, about what's going on. Ben's done a lot of research recently on this. He's got some good data on what's happening with the workforce related to this whole, I call it the great reprioritization because I think resignation is just one of the symptoms that we're seeing. But again, we're just going to be talking about what's going on and how we at learn as learning and development professionals can actually play a big role. But before we do, we always got to have some icebreakers, have a little fun. Yes. The icebreaker question does relate, though, to the topic at hand. But the first one doesn't. The first one doesn't. By the way, how are you doing this morning, Ben? I am tremendous, Christopher. I'm so glad to be here and just having a great day. This is the best way to start the day, by the way. When Christopher Lynn's like, hey, do you have a few minutes to come on and, and join me a on the live show? Like, um, yes, absolutely. Why I wouldn't absolutely I do that? Do. So, yeah, all right. Yeah. You know what? I'm I'm equally as excited on this. So let's talk about this. So first part is, where are you in the world today? And you know what? You've been on the show before. Mm -hmm. But actually, it hasn't changed yet, but it's going to because yes. you're moving in like a few days. But location-wise, yes. where are you? I'm in Huntsville, Alabama, closest closest metro to where I am, which is now the – everyone knows it's the Rocket City. It's now the largest city in Alabama. We've passed Birmingham and everywhere else because of all really? the, the fun fun stuff going on here. So it's a, like a tech hub, really, really Exploding smart people. Growth. Yeah, and I'm just trying to hang out okay. with them hope they rub off on me all a little right. bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this, is this one of these destinations that all the folks from like, you know, the West Coast and th like, are they recreating a new hub in the Huntsville area then? So part of that, um, there's been, it's a long history, like BRAC and some of the other like military stuff has pushed people here. But DC, actually, a lot of people in the last year really? have shoved out of DC because we are the, after DC, Huntsville is the second highest priority for government contracting firms. And so, mm -hmm. and I'll, okay. I'll tell you the little like tidbit that I learned all these years ago, cause it's no longer relevant now, maybe, but Huntsville's <laughs> the second highest target for espionage from other countries actually, uh, because of all that stuff going on. So it's a, it was always a neat so you place. Got, like tech geniuses and James and Jane Bond floating yes. around in yes. Huntsville. Who on earth would have thought, okay, all right, well, there you go. Maybe maybe there's more to the meets the eye with Ben here. I don't know. Yeah, I'll Time will tell. tell. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm in Waukesha, Wisconsin with my friendly house plant, Fred, like I always am. And now here we go with the question that is somewhat related to the great resignation right now. You, you gave me a part of the story, mm -hmm. but I'm interested to hear the rest. So what's the most interesting way? And I said interesting. You define mm -hmm. that how you want. That you've quit a job, Ben. So I'll tell you, 11 years ago, um, we had been going through the adoption process and we got the call, hey, Bergman's going to labor. So we went to the hospital, the babies were born, all was well. And I went back, stopped by the office because I told them that day, like, hey, the babies are going to be here today. I stopped by the office and told my boss, like, hey, I've cleaned everything up. I've got everything settled. I'm going to be out for about a week to take care of everything at home. And I'll come back and I'll probably, you know, work, we'll work on the flexibility stuff after that. Okay. And she was like, are you sure you want a whole week? I'm like, <laughs> what? There are two of these. They're twins, right? So they're, um, I was so flustered at that. Like five like, whole days, right? I mean, yes. seriously. Oh. And the, on the way home, I'm like, this is this is not going to work, right? Someone that doesn't care about the same things that I care about or have the same priorities that I have. And I know you're a, you're a family guy, Christopher, so that probably would have irked you as well. And I decided then and there that I was going to quit. And so I'll tell you the second part of the story really quick. When – when I was getting ready to leave, right, we had an HR team of seven. And so we're sitting together. Okay. What's who's going to take over Ben's stuff when he's gone. 
And like the biggest thing I've been doing in my first HR job years ago is like filing was the big thing. <laughs> they said, you know your what? Proudest, your proudest moment. <laughs> they said, you know what? He's been doing all this filing stuff for all these years and we probably don't need to do all that. We could just like streamline this and not have to do all those things. And so not only was I leaving and they were not backfilling me, but like they decided that the work I'd done for the last two and a half years was not even worth doing anyway. Wow. Okay. <laughs> like that, that hurt on a, on a deep kind of level. And now I look back and laugh. Cause I'm like, I have been trying to advocate for like, I have other stuff I could be doing. There's way more important things to be done around here. And they, they always kind of push that off. And then when I'm leaving, they realized that maybe I was you know actually right. Maybe we just don't need that anymore. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, so my so my story is similar in 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 terms of your your point about family things. Really. So I had I won't we'll, we'll protect the names of the innocent on this, but I was in a role, and I had a new boss that started. And and when this gentleman started, I knew I'm like this is either going to go really well or this is going to not go well at all. And as he started, one of the first things he did was he announced that he wanted his leadership team traveling around, doing road shows. He didn't use this term, but shaking hands, kissing babies, this. And I just remember going, mm, no, I'm not. I, like, I have a bunch of little kids. I'm not going to do this. You kiss enough babies, shaking. right? 10 yeah, feet from I you. Kiss, I kiss enough babies. Thank you. And so anyway, I remember I let him know this. Uh, that, that that probably was not going to work for me. I think I might have gotten a little feisty about it because we were debating something. And anyway, as we did this, he said, um, he said, well, here's the deal. You're going to be where I want you to be when I want you to be there. You're not going to be here anymore. And I remember going, wow, OK, so we're playing that game. And um, so I, I kind of just didn't really say much at the time because I thought, well, I, I'm not really prepared for this. But he th the next day is like, you've got two weeks. And I'm like, to decide? He's like, yeah, to decide. So let me know what your answer is and we'll just go from there. And I just remember being like, really? Like all my, t we're just, good. okay. So I talked to Ashley about it. I'm like, I don't know that I can do, I had no backup plan. This was not part of the plan. But I just remember going, no. And she was very supportive. She's like, you cannot work in that environment. If something like this is just wait till you're there. So I went back and I just said, well, guess your option is it's not going to be me. So let's start drafting up what that looks like. I guess I'm going to be done. Um, and so I left and yeah, you know what? And, and it worked out just fine. So if anybody's in one of those toxic environments and you're feeling like this is the worst, I can't, and I don't even there's there's greener pastures on the other side so long as you're looking at it objectively. All right. I know. It was interesting. Interesting. But, you know what? I made it. So, so let's so on this topic, let's talk about this a little bit because the great resignation is something I I hear that term being thrown around quite a bit, but let's let's define this in case people maybe haven't heard it as much or you know, what's going on. So you've done some research on it. So I'd love your analyst, official analyst take. Yes. Hold on. on. I got my analyst what hat around here somewhere. I'll put it on. Please put on your glasses, maybe a, a mustache and top hat. And let me know, how does Ben Eubanks, <laughs> industry analyst, define the great resignation? So really, again, it's ever if you've have somehow avoided the news for the last, you know, couple of months and to don't know what we're talking about, um, the, the great resignation is basically this culminating point here where employers are saying, we're going to start requiring these things again. We're going to start changing these policies. We're going to start part of it's that. And I, what I like that you said, is the reprioritization because it's actually a lot of things hitting kind of at the same time. And it's just the symptom of it. The fallout is that people are saying, Hey, if this is how it's going to be, I'm going to be stepping away. I'm going to find something else. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to start my own business. I'm going to find a better company. I'm going to, I'll just stop working for a little bit and take a breath and then decide what I'm going to do next. Um, I talked to a, a friend who works for a company in the learning technology space, you and that you and I both know very well. And she said the summer, like, you know what, this last year has been really hard for me. I'm actually just going to take off for the next six months and just travel months. around. Yep. And just go, just go, go explore things because I, like I, said, I can, and because now's the time I want to do it. And so in the last year, as we've been, some of us have been working in jobs that have been pushing us remote or forcing us to be a little more secluded than we normally are. There are, there are people who have said, 
you know what, I, I like this, or there's a thing about this that's been self-reflective. And so it's given people a, a chance to think through some things. Cause I know when you and I talked about the third day, you said, has this been like always coming? Is this now just because of this? Or yeah. is this something that like, there's a, there was an event that happened that suddenly turned this on. And I think it's a combination of a lot of different things that again, that are coming together all at once. So essentially the, the, the headline version is, watch out all your people are going to quit on you and <laughs> it, the world's going to be you know burning burning shambles right. in, a, in a few days is how the is how it's kind of poised and the challenge for me again as the researcher i'm like i want to i want to understand this i want to figure out what this yeah. actually looks like what's the degree magnitude but also if i told any of you out there listening right now is that tomorrow 60 percent of your people are going to quit you're like okay how do I even prepare for that? What, what do I do? Who for is that? it? Who is it? Yep. What jobs are they in? What work are they doing? What skills do they have? Like there's, that's so vague and broad. It's a great headline, but it doesn't tell you what to do. And so that's one reason we're gathering some data. So Chris, for right now I'm refreshing this because like there's some data. He's gathering. refreshing it live. Yes. He's got something like on the market right I'm now. Like ticker, a little this. market ticker. Well, I, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, you need a, a top hat and some fancy glasses. I'll work on that. But I think this is what's, what's interesting about this is, your point is spot on in terms of the chicken little activity that's happening a little bit right now where, you know, the sky is falling. 80% of your workforce is going to disappear in the next 12 months. And, and people are running around frantically thinking like, when's the shoe going to drop? And to your point earlier, I mean, this has been my perspective. Look at engagement scores. Not I don't want to get into the engagement survey debate of whether they're effective or not, but the bottom line is they were a data point. A large percentage of the workforce has been kind of eh, for quite a I mean, this isn't news that most a good chunk of your workforce has kind of gone, you know what? If I could do something different, I'd do it in a heartbeat. I'm not real happy where I am. And so the fact that now we're going, <gasps> Oh, no. It's like, well, I mean, yes, the recent events have in some regards maybe shifted some people's perspective. They might have said, whoa, this thing I thought was never a possibility. Maybe it is. Maybe I actually could do something different or maybe I don't have to do this or that. But it's not personally, I don't think it's something that just blindsided everybody. And to the whole doom and gloom thing. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to over the years who have said, I'm going to quit this job. I'm going to quit. And then you call them five years later and say, hey, what are you doing? Well, I'm still, in, I don't like this job, but I'm, so I think, yes, it's an actionable event, but it always should have been. This is something we should have been really focused on before. Now, based on your research, though, would you say there's a higher risk of a larger percentage of people that, may action against this because of the last 18 months? Yes. There's a couple different factors in that. Um, shortage of talent overall. And that's driving right salary inflation and other things like that. So there are there are several different factors that are pushing this. And yeah. um, again, one like little bitty tiny example of that, I, I talked with this group of recruiting companies a few weeks ago, and they said that their recruiters are getting stolen away by the big tech companies who have done great through all of the things that have happened last year. All of them have been fine, right? They and said they're, they're throwing money at them like – Two, three X, like a recruiter, mid-level recruiter for technical recruiting is getting 200 K as a, as a base plus incentives and everything else. And that's just like one example, but they said this, that kind of thing is happening for all the jobs that they're hiring for and trying to compete for and everything else. I talked yes. to a company recently that said, she told me as the hiring leader, she said, we've made X number of offers and 50% of those have been countered in the last couple of months. And so we're, they're seeing this trend where people are countering everything just to see what's going to stick and to see what's going to go on there. So, yeah, no, you know, it's interesting because I'm friends with a fair amount of folks in talent acquisition and they've said, this is like a mess right now because the organization is struggling and they can't even keep their own teams together in many regards because they're getting poached yes. left and right. And what's interesting is mid pandemic, I remember there was a lot of, you know, talk kind of the chicken little thing was happening again, where it was, you know, everybody's going to quit. All this is going to happen. Your talent's going to go to these organizations that are embracing this. And many did. But now the second waves come because those organizations that thrive through the pandemic, who financially are well positioned, are suddenly going, we want the best and we can afford to pay for them. So go out and find them. And whatever it is, get them. 
just get them. And, and I've, I've similar to you, I've heard some people that in mid-level jobs have doubled their salary because a big company has said, Nope, we're, we're pulling you in. Yes. Yes. Well, there's like, there's a, I talked to a, I talked to a lady a few weeks ago that was whip smart, like an IO psychologist that has this big first picture perspective of the industry. She said, it's funny because 10 years ago, my advice was find the right person because you, you know, you could put out a job and people would, would fall all over themselves, tripping over themselves to apply for it. You could just pick through that and find the very best person. She said today it's, it's a lot harder to do that. So basically you're going to take what you can get with the expectation that you hire the right attitude and then develop them because they're going to have some kind of gap. They're not going to be perfect when you hire them. They're going to have some opportunity for you to level them up. And that's what's, that's what's powerful because I, I see companies that, that lead with that as part of their branding and part of their, their yeah. recruiting conversations is we're going to hire you and not expect you to be here forever. We're going to, we're going to keep helping you to step up to those next levels because we think you're more valuable than, than where you are right now. And you can be more valuable and you, you want to progress and you want to excel. And for some reason, for a long time, it was the expectation that we're going to hire you for this job and you're going to stay there. Yeah, we are going to find you and you're going to love it and you're going to be in this role forever. Yes. yes. Type of, and, and I agree. I think that's a shift that even in some of the conversations I've had with other learning leaders, they're having to say, you know what? I The idea of finding my rainbow unicorn with the diamond studded tiara candidate, I, I've got to step away from that, which first of all, going back to some of the other things where the idea that that used to work really well and it doesn't now, like, come on. It didn't really work well before, but anyway, we were, you know, taking forever looking for candidates. Roles were taking forever to fill. Where I, but again, I think this opportunity has created this space where now hiring managers are saying, "What if we focus more on development and let's find that person who's close or capable for the role, but can be developed into that role and grow into it?" So I think it's, but it's a win-win because to some degree. That's that's a competitive edge, I, I think, because if I'm a candidate, the last thing that is super motivating, at least for the long term, is to be, hey, we're hiring into this job that you could do in your sleep. And, um, you know, can you start? And also, would you be willing to stay for at least seven to 10 years? That's not a that's not a real big opportunity. Yeah, not exactly. Uh, so it's interesting. I talked to a. Uh, I talked to some some leaders a few weeks ago about career development, right? Career progression, mobility, and one of them was like, "Yeah, but when I talk to people, they're like, they're happy where they are. They're they're pretty, you know, they're okay in the job they're in." I said, statistically, based on the research that we have done on over a <laughs> thousand employers, for every so we did research on employers this year. We've done research on the actual learner learners in the workforce, and we're doing a new study right now on that that group as well. But the research we've done on the learners in your workforce, statistically, for every person that says, hey, I'm good, I'm actually okay where I am, I'm kind of, I mean, maybe I'm close to retirement, or I'm, I've got a busy personal life, so I just want this stability that I've got right now. For every person that says that, there are two people that are saying, where's the ladder, where's the next step, I'm looking for what's next, because if you don't help me paint that picture of what's next, the recruiter that calls wow. me from the competition will paint that picture for you. Yep. You know, and this is... This is where we can start tying this into specifically learning and development, because I know a lot of learning leaders that I've been connecting with recently, the organizations are looking to them going, what do we do with this? And, and again, not that it's a new problem. The problem has always been there, but it's a problem that now is getting even greater attention of how do we develop these people? Because we may have talent gaps where people left and we're struggling to find a backfill. So what does development look like so we can bring in earlier talent and fill it or how do we how do we mo mobilize talent that we have maybe we have people and i mean there's a lot of things that suddenly l and d leaders are getting asked and they're going uh we, well, we, we've got what? like our leadership academy and it's like that's not what people are looking for right now but before we dive too far into that i am curious on this because one of the things that came out of this and i think there's merit to it but in some regards, it's almost become overly focused. And now you see this war waging between this is, okay, the whole remote work debate blew up as a result of COVID. And so everybody was on the remote work train, which I'm a big advocate of remote work for sure. I work remotely, but I also recognize 
it's not for everyone. And this whole idea of let's cram everybody into the same mold is going to, is going to not go well, but I'm curious because there was this whole push of, well, flexibility, remote work, like let's just create universe. That'll solve it. Does the data support that? Is the, is the magic bullet for solving this flexible working? How about flexible work is an option here and it does solve some of this, but the problem is that Christopher, for those of you listening, just defined what flexible work is in his head, right? And if I told you what flexible work is for me, it may be a little bit different. And for every single person listening and for every one of the people that works for us, there's a little different flavor of that. And the problem is we think the solution to this is let's write a policy that allows us to support flexible, flexible work, <laughs> right? And we are defining that for our people. And 99% of the companies I talked to have not yet asked their people what flexibility means to them. Your people might want flexibility. I actually did a piece yeah. last week that has been like on my heart, not just in my head, but in my heart for a long time, in the last, especially the last year, where we talk about flexibility all the time. Like, yeah, yeah, but those other people over there who are working construction and retail and food service and all these other jobs, too bad, right? Flexibility is for, for us, like the higher class of workers. We're and so- workers. What I, I wrote this piece, how to, how to incorporate flexibility into non-flexible jobs. And it looks at how we can think about that. And the number one lens is ask your people, because if they say, I want flexibility, it might just be, I want to be able to swap shifts with somebody else instead of a manager having to be in the middle of that process and approve that, right? Or I want to be able to, to give you notice if my kid's daycare gets shut down because someone's got a quarantine within 24 hours. Like, I might just find out about that. Don't dock me. Don't hit me. Don't ding my, my record yep. because I have to let you know at the last minute. And like those are two real examples I've heard from people in the last couple of weeks that are having to deal with those things. And so flexibility may not mean you can all just go work remotely and check in with us if you need anything. And we'll send you a stipend so you can cover your home internet. And like, we assume all these things. Some people want that for sure. I don't want to sure. make light of that. But there is this spectrum of flexibility. And some of your people might just want this thing. And we're assuming they want this thing, this big old expensive thing that we can't offer everybody. And so we just stay away from it. They may just want this thing. And if you can understand from them, take some time. You mentioned like a survey, like I'm a fan of data and surveys because because that's the work that I do. Ask some questions that are open-ended and let them tell you the kind of things that they want. Because what I'm expecting to see in this data, I don't know, but my hypothesis is we're going to see some of the people who are like, hey, I'm a mom with kids under the age of 10. I'm more likely to be quitting because I need flexibility, right? I need my company to support work-life balance and things like that. I expect that more often than I expect it to come from a 20-year-old single male, right? Yeah. But yep. again, the headline is too broad and too too vague for us to be able to make any sense of that. And so I'm, that's why I'm excited about the data, not for its own sake, but for the stories it tells us and the actions that it helps us to take out of this. Well, and and for those watching, I'd love just, I mean, if you, well, if you can, just comment in. I'd be curious your definition of it. Because from the beginning, and I think even in our last conversation, we talked about this, that personalized flexibility probably is more the thing we as organizations should be working towards, which involves having those conversations with people and finding out what is it. Because to your example, frontline workers, a lot of times, well, they, they, we can't give them remote work. Yeah. Who said anything about having to give everybody remote working possibilities? And granted, I will be the first to say, I would challenge some of that in certain environments where it's yes. like you look at healthcare where they go, oh, it can't be remote. Well, uh, telemedicine would start to tell you otherwise, and that's going to become a competitive advantage. So there are even some of these frontline spaces where you go, if you really start thinking outside the box, you might find some ways you can do this. But even where you can't, those conversations of what does that look like? And I think sometimes it's this fear of, well, what are they going to say? And what if we can't give it to them? These are adults. We can have these conversations. And most, most, are you going to have your outliers that go ballistic when you say, well, you run a bulldozer and I don't know that we can have you working from home 100%, right? Right. You're going to have somebody that just blows a gasket over that. Yeah. But I would say most adults would say, well, I understand that. I understand that. That's not what I'm asking for. What I'm asking for is whatever that looks like. Like you said, whatever whatever that means. And it might be a heck of a lot easier than you think. And suddenly you go, 
oh, this thing I've been avoiding, hoping it just go away, that's killing my workforce and destroying engagement. You're telling me all I had to do was remove the manager, you know, approval setting on shift swaps? Like, that's it? That's all? Well, maybe. I'm not, please do not take that to be like, oh, there's the universal policy. No. <laughs> but you might find some of these things are that simple that can have a dramatic impact. And it sounds like the data is is showing that that's really what people are looking for. Yeah. Can we have like a quick, just kind of ask you something, I guess? Yes. Um, everybody is, you're asking me a lot of questions, but. That's fine. <laughs> how weird is this that the things that we do and we talk about every day is actually a headline right now that everyone's talking about outside of the learning and the talent and the HR space that we live in. Like, that's just a kind of a weird, surreal thing for me, actually. I've, I've stopped and like, the, the pinch yourself for a second, because usually it's like this thing happened over here and it's, hey, I've got a resume. Will you look at that for me? Because you worked in HR, you worked in recruiting, like, sure, right? Or like someone asked like those really, those side questions, but this is in the headlines. And my wife was like, hey, what is this great resignation thing that they're talking about? <laughs> Yeah, it's in like the news type stuff. I know upskilling, skill development. It's like New York Times. You're like, yes. what is this? I didn't yes. see. You didn't see. You know, you you've never seen the next generation of learning management systems on Business Insider before. But right, these are, and I think this goes back to a conversation I had what two weeks ago, week and a half with with Matthew Brown from Skooks. We were talking mm -hmm. about the fact as learning and talent professionals, we have a massively unique opportunity right now because this is the conversation that's happening in the boardrooms, in the executive conference rooms, in the executive Zoom rooms, if those are a thing too. But right, wherever those conversations are happening, we're actually really uniquely positioned. And I can't believe how many L&D leaders I talk to and even my own personal experience where there's things that you we used to have to fight for to say, listen, listen to it. And they're going, yep. Uh-huh. Okay. Go do it then. And in some regards, I think that's actually catching a lot of people in our field off because they're being told, yeah, yeah, no, we get it. Now go fix it. And everybody's in some ways kind of panicking going, oh, I wasn't really prepared for this. I wasn't prepared to action against it. And they're finding their leaders going, okay, go do it. Which is part of also what we wanted to talk about today was, so what do you do about it? Because that can be a real risk to you as a function, if you go in and say, listen, talent mobility and hybrid workforce is a priority and they go, yes, we agree, great, uh, go, go, go fix it. And you're like, well, uh, oh, I didn't, like <laughs> I didn't get catch, any further dog on chasing my the car. If they catch that. it, what do they do with it, right? Like, wait a minute, right. I didn't know you were gonna say yes. Hold yeah, on. I didn't know you were gonna say yes. <laughs> So what do you do about it? So there's lots yeah. of different levers we can pull. Um, one of the biggest things that I'm an advocate for is getting, and again, this is this is a big like a barrel of fish hooks, but getting your managers involved in some of these kinds of things, because we can make all the programs and set up all the processes and provide all the tools. And if that person's got a manager that doesn't care about them, doesn't support them, doesn't connect with them, then the, there's some research that shows that of all the things that we can touch on the talent side, like even up to someone's comp and benefits and everything else, all those things we can touch, if their manager is a jerk, they're still responsible for 70% of their satisfaction on the job. So getting them in the loop on this is gonna help us to solve for it. And so like some of the most basic things that I advocate for are when you're when you're having conversations with your people on those one-on-ones, how, how about this? We'll train our managers to do this in those one-on-ones. When they're doing those one-on-ones, to spend a little time saying, what do you need? What do you want? What, what are you trying to do next? How can I help you get there? Ask some open-ended questions, not a yes or no. Do you have what you need? All right. But what do you need? How can I help you? Is there something that that, that we can do to yeah. make this make this better for you? Is there something frustrating you right now? Even if it's not a thing that you can take out of the way, like you were saying, Christopher, saying, acknowledging that, like, yeah, that that would be really hard. You know what? We'll talk about that next time. We'll see if there's something we can do about it or right. Just having the awareness of what's bothering them. That helps. I mean, even, even just personally, I, I just think of myself when, when you're having a hard time or whatever, somebody just taking the time to sit down and just say, what is, what is going on? And sometimes just the opportunity to say this and have somebody go, yeah, that is, yeah. you know, that is tough. I, I can see that, you know, 
And even then saying, you know, what might be some things we can, you know, do you have any ideas for what we might be able to do? Because I think, again, sometimes as leaders, we think, well, having that conversation means I have to be able to say yes to everything. I have to be able to go action against this. And I've got to come up with all the solutions versus, well, you can ask, like, is there anything that you've thought of that you think might make that better? I mean, we might not be able to change the whole thing, but have you come up with any idea? So I think your point about managers, I know for me, from my priorities, what, developing leaders and profiling good leaders is a huge thing because this is one of the things going back to this whole flexibility thing. If you're going to try and fight for flexibility and you don't include leaders and leader development and skill sets in that, good luck. <laughs> Because some of these legacy mindsets in leadership are going to shoot all of your efforts in the foot. You can write HR policies that say whatever, but they're always going to have at manager discretion in the fine print. And if your leaders are still monsters, well, you can tell them you can work remotely or you know take whatever days you need. And but if you think the managers are going to support it or not make people miserable, even in that environment, they will. And I think that's a that's a really important call out in that. One of the things I was going to say there is we're sometimes we're afraid or worried about what we're going to hear. Right? We talked about that a couple of times, and sometimes they're going to say things about you, right? If you're a leader, they are. So number. I don't want this to get lost in this conversation. Now, we're talking about you advocating to your leaders on how to engage with their people. But if you are leading a team right now, then you should be taking these things to heart for yourself as well. Be asking these yeah. questions. Um, don't assume that, hey, we've we checked it off. We're all remote maybe and suddenly we're okay because that might not be the thing they need. No. This is just good leadership overall. One of the things that I always advise though, when because leaders are going, some, some leaders are going to take that hard. They're going to hear those things. They're going to hear that as like, as an attack on them or their leadership or their, their some sort of failure. And I always advise them to look at this as a process improvement exercise, not as a, an indictment on your leadership capabilities or an indictment on your management style. This is a, a process improvement exercise where we're all together trying to figure out how to solve that thing. One of my good friends talks about it like a, like a marriage counselor would, right? One of the, one of the turning points, if there's a marriage in trouble is getting them to say, instead of fighting against each other, we're going to fight together against this thing. Yep. That's when those things change. And, that's the same thing. How do we get the managers, our managers on board with that, get our people on board with that? Instead of saying it's, you're going to ask for something and then it's going to be us versus you. It's a zero sum game. Right. No, it's like, we are all trying to make this the best place we can, that it can be so we can serve our customers well. And what's it going to take to do that? We are working together towards that goal. Trying to convey that most people, as strange as this sounds, have never had someone openly have a discussion with them about that from a leadership perspective. And that's an opportunity to create engagement if you want to use the buzzword yeah. right or all these other things it's a way to create a better relationship is what it comes down to well and i think this is so on this topic because this is i will say as an lnd practitioner this sometimes often <laughs> a lot sometimes a, every day a, a, a great deal of time right people leaders are this bottleneck for us a lot of times people leaders are this bottleneck where we go We've got all these, these great things. We've got all this great development. And then we send them back and their leaders screws it up. They mess it up. And, and it's easy to just point the finger and go, well, there's nothing we can do because until managers change. And I would say, well, that's not true because we really can have a really powerful impact on that. So, so I'll throw that excuse out of the window. And I think that may be holding you back if that's your attitude anyway. But I think going back to this manager piece, uh, I, I've, I was talking with an organization recently about manager development and they work with frontline leaders and all the way up leaders all the time. And the statistics they had on how infrequently people leaders have had the conversations you're talking about, it was staggering. I don't remember the numbers, so I won't quote it, but I remember going, are you kidding me? Because to me, just thinking like having one-on-ones, asking people how they're doing, check that's not normal. And they're like, no, actually it's not. Statistically, most people leaders have never had that conversation. Now where L&D can help with that, because you could throw, throw the talent and go, well, where are we going to go from here? But we actually are uniquely positioned to create, and this is something that I've done over the years, is to create simulations to give people opportunities to practice that. 
Because honestly, one of the reasons they don't happen is managers are terrified to do it. They don't want to practice on a direct report and go, okay, so I've never had a conversation like this in my life, but here goes nothing. Even though I would say, you know what, if you are a people leader, try it out. I think you'll find people are far more forgiving and appreciate authenticity of being like, I've never done this before. So if I feel a little awkward and it just here, here goes, but I think that's where as L and D leaders, there is a really unique opportunity for us to say, this doesn't have to be big. We don't need to go build a new university out somewhere, but be able to say, how can we create simulations, opportunities where a manager can come practice having that conversation. And that does not need to be something that takes an L&D team nine months to spin up and, and $500,000 in resources to do it. I mean, off the top of my head, I could, I could create a 10 minute conversation structure and say, okay, how do we create this? Now, how do we scale this so that we can give managers the opportunity to practice this? And let's let's give them feedback on it. And honestly, technology is allowing this to scale. But I'm curious your reaction to that, because to me, sometimes this is one of those things where it's like, you know how you get managers to have better conversations? You get them practicing better conversations because the reality is telling them, go do this, they're just going to say, eh, yeah, I, that sounds really hard and everybody plays this stuff up in their head or they say I, I do have conversations with them right i talk to them all the time yeah i do I, I talk to them all the time i had a i had a leader at a previous job that every friday we had a standing call it was the first remote job i ever had we had a standing call every week and 100 percent of the content of that conversation was what have you done this week what are you doing next week not a single bit was how can i help you what do you need what support can we offer not a single bit and so I'm like if you'd asked him, right, in this this conversation, he'd be like, well, yeah, we talk all the time, one-on-ones, absolutely. But it was yeah. all about what have you done for me lately? That was his his perspective or for the company lately, right? That's part of his job as a manager is to make sure I'm doing the things he's be doing. I get that. But if there had been a little bit of that, what you're talking about here, where it's a little bit more of an open-ended conversation, a little bit more of a how do I help you? What do we need? It doesn't – I'm not saying we need to spend the entire time on those things because that's ridiculous, but if we spent the last 10% of the time or the last 10 minutes, um, one of the ways I've, I've seen a company do this, they said, hey, we're going to, you have that one-on-one -on -one with your manager. It's, it's part of the, what you do here. But the last 10 minutes is sacred. It is your time. You can sit there and stare at each other for 10 minutes. You can ask <laughs> them you questions. you can't talk about your like, Yes. Update. Don't, no more tasks and things. At that point, it's it's your call on how you use that. You can ask them whatever you want to ask them. They'll tell you what they can tell you. They'll you can ask them for support. You can, and that I don't like it as much because it puts all the onus on the employee to try to figure out what question can I ask that's not going to sound weird yeah. or whatever else. Like as a leader, asking those things. We talk about mobility as an example in this conversation of what's going to connect people. Um, uh, Tata Consultancy Services, TCS, massive, hundred thousand employees. They have a practice where in every one of those conversations, the, their, the manager says, what are you thinking you want to do next? Some version of that question. And from the ver the first week on the job, when you meet with your manager and they're like, hey, how's the first week been? What do you think you want to do next? Which sounds really weird to say that, by the way, in the very first week on the job, because most of the time it's shut up and get back to work. Yeah. But they're drilling that into them. Like, we are always thinking about what's next for you. And we want you to always be thinking about that for yourself. We want, this should not just be all on one party or the other. So we, that's one of the things we actually did research on this year. And we asked learners and we also asked employers who has the most responsibility over this career progression stuff. And learners were much more likely to say themselves. We were more likely as learning and training leaders to say, we've got a bigger Us. responsibility to do this. Right. Yeah. Um, but one of the interesting things we do when we cut the data by those people, remember I mentioned the two versus the one earlier, the two people who have left the job because there was no advancement versus the one person who was willing to stick around. The people who have left the job put even higher burdens on leaders, their managers, on HR and training, on themselves. They put a higher burden on every one of those parties, more responsibility on them because they see that as this kind of interplay of how we can do that. But anyway, TCS, sorry, I got carried away there. One of the things that they do is they, they do practice and just to show how effective it is, their CEO, their CTO, and their CFO all started the company as trainees years ago. And using that simple practice in every conversation has leveled them up. So 
I wanted to say that could reinforce this idea. This, this doesn't have to be this multi-million dollar investment to make this no. happen. It could no. be something as simple as we're going to embed this in the DNA of who we are as a company. And we're always going to be caring about what Ben wants to be next or what Christopher wants to be next or what Sally wants to be next. We want to be thinking about those things and helping them think about that because when the opportunity arises, you don't want it to surprise them or them to feel like they're unprepared or like no one, no one even, I never considered that there'd be something internal that I could do next. Like, no, that's well, the expectation. A lot of people do just have this idea that like, well, my next job has to be somewhere else because they don't know what else it is. Now there's a couple things that I'm going to tack on to this because I think you really hit on a couple things. One though, I, I want to bring up uh, Jess's comment because I think this is one of these yes. really important pieces, which is no matter what. And again, this is, this can be scary, uncomfortable territory if you're a people leader. Cause you're like, I haven't, done this to your point i've had one-on-ones or maybe i have meetings all the time but now that i'm thinking about it i'm going "Ooh, yeah i guess i haven't really said like how are you or and and that can feel uncomfortable but that relationship piece i think this is something we saw over the last 18 months where we had a lot of people who thought they had these strong team relationships and these strong work relationships suddenly they weren't in the office anymore and they went <gasps> We don't have any relationships. What happened? Remote work broke them. And it was like, you never had them in the first place. You weren't having real conversations. You were just having these tactical ones. So Jess, I, I completely agree with what you're saying here. And I think that's an important message, not just if you're a people leader, but for learning and talent professionals is that reinforcing this, you have to, this takes time. It can be uncomfortable. It can be awkward, but building that into a manager's repertoire is such a huge component of success and it's going to take some time. Now, the other piece that I would, I would, I don't know if it's quite a counter. It's, it's kind of a counter to one of the things you said is that as a people leader, and I think this is back, goes back to creating opportunities for managers to practice this because they do struggle with this is the fact that a manager asking someone, so what do you want to do next? That can be a really dangerous territory to go into if you haven't practiced or know how to have that conversation. Because the reality is there is a large percentage of your workforce that has no idea what the answer to that question is. And it can be very much putting someone on the spot like, I don't I don't know. And that can create a real sense of uncomfort like, well, like, am I in trouble now because I because I, I don't really know. And they and my experience has been people that are on my team. When I talk about their career development, they are very interested in you as the people leader's perspective on, well, what do you think? Like, what do you think about me? Which goes back to this relational piece. If you're not talking to them, understanding what makes them tick, what they like, what they don't like, what, how they are as an individual, guess what? You're not going to have a lot of answers for them when they say, I'm not 100% sure. What do you think? You're like, well, I don't know. Because for the last five years, all you've ever told me is what you've done over the last week, and I haven't really been paying attention. So I think that's one of those things from a manager perspective where leaning in on this, you know, I've I've had a number of these conversations and recently had some where it was, you know what, I don't know what, I think you need to figure that out, but here's what I see in you. These are some of the characteristics I see that I think you're extremely strong at. That could lead to something like this. And that may be something we might be able to explore. Now, I'm not, I agree that I don't think managers need to say, it's all on you. Like, go, you know, figure it out. There has to be some responsibility. As a people leader, you can't just say, well, I, I you figure it out. But I think there is this balance of, well, you know them, they work for you. You know what their strengths and opportunities are. They do want your input. Is that reasonable? Absolutely. See, I didn't. I don't know if it was exactly. I, a, a I was counter. hoping. For, I was hoping to to prove you wrong there, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you, you on that. You were lining up. You were like, "Here we go. We're I, gonna duke it out." My my joke is always when someone's like, "Hey, I've got I've got to tell you something." You know that that uh, I've got a different opinion. I'm like, "You can be wrong, and we'll still be friends. It's okay." <laughs> and, <laughs> no, but I mean. Again, like I said, and, and and this is coming from the practitioner world and a longtime people leader where it, yes, there I've been in that situation where you're asked, like, so what do you want to do next? You're like, I don't, I don't know. Like, I'm not even sure what's out there. And as a people leader, you're probably more connected to the organization. You know opportunities that might exist, which again, mindset shift. If you think your talent is your property, 
well, we got a bigger problem that we've got to solve in that. Yes. So there's a book called The Best Team Wins. If I could turn and show you the, the bookshelf over here, I'm a huge reading nerd. There's a book called The Best Team Wins. And one of the key tenets of that book is everybody hates micromanagers. But if you micromanage someone's career and you're always kind of focusing on it and helping them think about it and guiding them through this self-reflection because some of them don't have that that personal awareness to know what's next and some jobs, right? This might be the first person's first job. So they don't wait. Yep. I mean, I, there is something else I could do. So there's, there's this big spectrum there, but always be thinking about that and helping them think about it. It's like everybody hates a micromanager, but if you micromanage someone's career, they'll love you. What's kind of the, one of the tenets of the book, <laughs> but there's a, there's a, another piece to this. Again, go back to the, to the data, to the research. We did a study recently. We're about to redo the study to see what the, how things have shifted and changed. We found that if you are a company with better revenue, better retention, better engagement, right? So the, the company that we would like to work in that's doing better, they do a couple of different things when it comes to these kind of conversations. And you actually hit on one a minute ago, looking at someone's specific strengths, right? Not treating me like I'm the same as everybody else, but what do I do differently that you see as a strength that we can leverage within the business? Um, looking at how to develop them as part of a performance conversation, not just a, what have you done for me lately? Or six months ago, you did this wrong. And I'll tell you about it now because it's our official meeting. No, like be thinking about how to develop and grow them. There's a couple other ones. I could weave into that. <laughs> Rec I mean, recognition, like I was trying to think about what other, what else fits into this conversation, like yeah. recognition fits into that, but recognizing them, appreciating them, like those things, again, we assume that those are done well because probably the people who are inclined to listen to a show like this already lean into those things. <laughs> they're self-aware enough or they're aware enough of what they do well, what they don't. Like I'll tell you outright right now in front of everybody, I'm not a great people leader. I am way too inward focused on things. I love to cast a big vision, but when it comes to like making sure they've done that thing and then recognizing, rewarding them for those things, I'm not great at those, those things. I've had to work on them over time as I've built a team yeah. and work that works with me, but I freely admit that I'm not good at those things. And so I try to stay away from that and outsource that or delegate that and let someone else do those parts of, of leading and organizing and planning because I'm much more about, let me cast this big vision and go in that direction. So yeah. having some, having some awareness oh, of those things isn't a bad yeah. thing. Well, and so, so because I, I knew this, we could have done this from like nine till probably noon and still been talking <laughs> and said we need more time. But the other piece with this, because I think the manager piece is huge. And, and there are some, you know, even Nancy brought it up. There's actually some low code solutions to this type of thing. Again, trying to create opportunities for managers to practice these conversations. And I think this is where it is so easy for us to over engineer this. And we don't have to. Right? It's messy. Relationships, they're messy. There, there's no perfect conversation between a manager and a direct report. And I think actually shattering that myth is one of the best things you can do because it's like, look, just have the conversation. The conversation is better, even if it's messy and uncomfortable and awkward and you don't have all the right questions. That's better than not. So let's just create opportunities to do that. I think the other thing as L&D and, and talent that we can focus on, and I've got a session planned while I'm out on parental leave that's going to be coming, um, I think it's actually in like a week and a half, with human intelligence, human intelligence, sorry. Juan is so sharp. That'll know, be fun. Right? It's going to be a fun one because I think there are some opportunities because the reality is people are, right, we're, we're not objective. We aren't always super insightful on things, even when we really try. And I think that's where some of the technology that's coming now has the opportunity this, this effort that's going on right now with assessing skills within people and assessing whether you want to call it culture or organizational, the, the lifeblood of an organization is extremely valuable because from a data standpoint, this can help us make less wrong moves, I think is the way I look at it. Right, where we can say, well, based on my biased opinion and your personal opinion and lack of self-awareness, we think that this is what's gonna be a great fit. But I don't know anything about the subculture over there and I'm not really sure if I'm right, so let's try it. And then you go over there and boom, like it just blows up and you go, well, I guess, and then it reinforces the message that see these conversations don't work, like look what a mess that was. And I think some of these technology solutions can actually done well, and I'm not gonna say technology is the silver bullet, so don't quote me on that piece, but done well 
They can't. Yeah, I know you're tweeting it right now. Christopher I'm, I'm, I'm writing it down. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is they can provide really meaningful data into, okay, here's Ben Eubanks skill profile. I know more about what Ben is good at, not based on my personal opinion or what I think or what, you know, my, my natural bias says, well, he's a, he's, he's really good at this when really maybe the data would say otherwise, or he's good at it, but he hates it. I learned that early. I was good at coding. I hated it. Somebody could have said you should be a software engineer, which they did. And I hated it. So I think some of that skill stuff, but then also when you hear Juan and I talking on human intelligence, not all roles are the same culturally in an organization. So even where that skill profile matches, you may move somebody and go, that is going to be a mess if you go there because you're just not going to fit type of a thing. And so I think this is another area. I'd love your reaction to this where we can, as an organization, say, you know, there are actionable things we can do. There are areas we can be moving and saying, you know, we can do a better job and we can be at the center of this and go to the boardroom and say, that thing keeping you up at night, I actually have some suggestions on what we can do to solve for this. I'll stop, that was a rant. So what was the actual question? I was like, all, I was all caught up in the flow of that. And what was the actual question? Well, on so that? my question is, right, are you seeing this? Cause you're doing this research around it and you talk to a lot of organizations. I just think of the article I read on Unilever over the weekend and some of these other organizations that are doing this, Again, I think it can be easy to throw your hands up in the air, but are you seeing other organizations that are having success with this? Yes. Like again, for those of you that don't know the human intelligence, you'll you'll see the episode in a few weeks and you'll you'll see what he's talking about, but it really lets you see someone, someone's for lack of a better term, like an assessment on someone that allows you to see who they are and what the kind of things they believe and how they work, their work styles and those kind of things. And when you know even if it's not, hey, you're going to be in that team, but just know you're going to that meeting where there are four people that are like instant decision makers and they're just going to snap their fingers and just walk away from the decision like it's done and you're very deliberate. And just knowing those things allow us, the technology doesn't replace the human piece of this. It really it accentuates it and enhances that conversation. That's one of the, the key tenets of the book that I wrote on AI. And the, the second edition is coming out in January of next year. The whole thing is this technology should not replace the human piece of this. It should always emphasize, augment, accentuate, right? Automate those things that suck, that we hate, that we don't ever want to, ever want to do again and allow us to spend more time on those things that we really do. Like the people listening into this, not a single one of us woke up this morning like, I can't wait to go and tag 400 pieces of learning content. Like, that's gonna be, that's my day. Yeah, baby. No. Filing like, reports. What was the job you had? That right? Is, yes. That Filing paperwork. Not anymore. <laughs> per, oh, God. Personnel action forms. Ugh. Um, getting all those things off of our plates and allowing us to spend time on those things that really do matter, that do create these deep relationships, that do give us a chance to really connect to people. And the, the thing I always, the, the picture that comes out of my head is we think about all the stuff that you have to do, right? You're a learning leader, first and foremost, right? Well, after being a dad and family. I was going to say, well, right? I'm technically a devoted husband. In the top husband, seven yes. of the things that <laughs> you're doing. <laughs> Like the, the things at the top of that list for many of the leaders listening into this are like those more tactical, tangible kinds of things, right? We've got to yep. build this thing or solve that problem or track this course or report on those numbers. And down here, it's like, how do we build a culture that we're learning is first and foremost? How do we make sure that mobility is at the top of everyone's mind? Like those things are at the bottom of the list, but we never quite get to them because we're always doing the other churning stuff at the top that always, that list never stops. It always adds things in as we're checking them off. There's like two things when you go to- yeah clean your inbox out and you're like, wait a minute, I finished an hour later and there's like twice as many messages as when I started. Like those <laughs> kinds of things, that that applies there. And so the, the tools, I'm always a fan of the tools that help us check off some of those things at the top so we can focus on things on the bottom because that's the things you can't automate. You can't hand off to an algorithm. And some of the things we're talking about here, like all those things, probably almost everything we talked about today can be wrapped into tools, technologies can help us to do that better. But I'm never, ever, ever, even as the, the tech nerd that loves data, going to advocate for replacing those relationships because that's not going to lead to the best outcomes for anybody. And it's not going to, no. I would never, I would never ask you to do that because I wouldn't want to work there. And I'm not going to ask you to do something that I wouldn't do in my own workplace. Well, and I think it's, there's a couple things that go into this. And I think this, I'm the same way. I am all for tech. I am, I am 100% for pushing the needle on tech, but as there are certain lines and certain things where I go, nope, 
Like that needs to remain a human in the loop. Can we augment it with technology to improve and accelerate? Yes, but some of these things we need to say that has to happen. I think the other thing is, and this is, goes back to the whole why I said don't quote it, even though you already hashtagged it, you know, Christopher said, is the fact that tech, uh, there are certain things that that manager, that because one of the things that you run into is people get fearful, like, well, does this mean my job's at risk? The reality to that is no, because there's always a role that we play in some of that. Because the reality is, can a person, I just even think, we'll just, I'll preview to human intelligence. Could a people leader ignore all the amazing insights that that thing has gathered? <laughs> yes. Could they ignore the notifications and outlook that give them some insights into how to run a meeting based on the profiles of who's there? They can still all ignore that. And I think that's the hard work that we can now focus on is less on the, how do we get those insights? How do we put those insights into something and instead say, okay, how do we get people to action on that? How do we get people to do, do these things? Cause that challenge isn't ever going away. And that's the complex problem solving that we really need people focused on instead of the, okay, so how do we take the survey and get the survey aggr like, okay, let technology figure that piece out so you can then do the actionable piece behind it. So I think that's, Go ahead. You're about to jump in. I was like, in some places, they're they're cautious about mentioning technology and stuff. And obviously here, we're not. And so I was cautious earlier. I'm like, why should I be? So um, you mentioned human intelligence, right? Um, there's a cool company called Joyous that's doing this, that allows you to have those kind of conversations. Because we're like, how do we do, how do we, how do we not just have those conversations and encourage them, but also have oversight, insight into them to understand what's happening so we can take action. So Joyous is doing some cool stuff around that where they, they can pulse out a question to all of your people, even on their mobile, and they can respond. And you can see that at a high level and it starts to roll up like, hey, you know what? People are really mentioning this thing this week. Maybe there's a leadership transition or there was a new benefits change or there's a, any number of things. And yep. like that gives you a chance to bubble those things up. There's a great company called Waggle that just got acquired recently, but they're still doing this. Um, that's, that does this as well. But it allows you to have more of a dialogue. It doesn't replace the human piece because you're, instead of, yeah. Just saying, hey, respond to this survey, which it gets lost in the sea of responses. It's like a more of a one-on-one -on -one sort of conversation at scale. And there's nothing more personal than you giving someone feedback and them hearing it and responding to you. That yeah. is so, so powerful. And that's what we talked about the, the human, the conversations, everything else. And that's that's what this all boils down to is like we're having that conversation that's based on our relationship. I'm I forgot her name, who mentioned that earlier, but that was a great point. Yes. It's based on the relationship. But that's yep. the, the big piece of this. Well, and I think this goes back to, you know, why do I, one of the reasons I do learning tech talks is how do we run that balance? Because it is a balance. You know, you look at some of the things we talk about, does it, does a talent mobility platform have a tremendous capability that it can help an organization mobilize talent and help people understand their skills and figure out, Hey, where are those opportunities? Yes. Will running out and buying a gloat fuel 50 degree career mobility, I'm throwing lot hitch, I'm throwing yes. lots out. So people know I'm not, you know, add, is that going to fix everything for you? It's not. Is a really great assessment tool going to fix it? No, it's not. But can it be powerful in helping with that? I think that's one of the big takeaways, which is why, to me, digital acumen is a huge... We want to talk development for our industry. Digital acumen, to me, is one of the top things we should be focusing on learning and talent leaders to understand how can technology do this? Because our role should be, what are we trying to do? Let's figure that out. And then we can accelerate it with technology. I think the other one big takeaway, well, there were lots of them, honestly. But I think another one was this whole focus on the way we think about leaders. And unfortunately, somebody has their privacy settings set. So I'm not exactly sure who it is. I'll, I'll try and refresh here. But I think this is another one is the shift in how we think about leaders and the way we approach leaders. And I agree with this comment from LinkedIn user, which I'll try and get the name here in a second, which is this whole shift of, you know what, being a coach is it's Abe, okay, is, is really like they're a coach. We need to think about them as coaching their team, coaching their talent. They're not, I'm bad with sports. So they're not the, the point guard or the center. I, I, I don't know, right? That may be a terrible analogy, but you get the point. They're not the star player on the team. They're the coach that's coaching the team, bringing out the best in people. And again, I think sometimes We've been working towards that, but if anything, this last 18 months has really exposed how important that is. If you're planning on, here's where I tie it all together, mitigating the great resignation. So 
with that, look at that, 59.55. Ben Eubanks, thank you for, at the 11th hour, making time, joining me this morning. Hopefully all of you that watch this live or listen to this after the fact, it stimulated your thinking, helped you kind of gather some additional thoughts uh, on the matter. And Ben, I appreciate you making the time with me this morning. I appreciate the big takeaway, which is tech is a silver bullet <laughs> from Christopher Lynn. <laughs> yeah, thanks. This, Thank this you was, for that. All kidding aside, this has been a tremendous opportunity. I love a chance to talk with the research. You you know well. And thank you to everybody that, that chimed in, that listened in, because this this conversation is a part of one that we're having here on your behalf, because it's a conversation we should all be having with the leaders in our company. So that's my encouragement to you is to go and take this conversation back, back to work with you. Yep. Have this conversation back at work, and you can start that today. So with that, happy Tuesday, and have a great week, everybody.